good evening to all of you it gives me great pleasure to welcome you once again here you will agree with me science is done by scientists but often the infrastructural support by way of scientific institutions offers a platform for the scientists to perform at his best unfortunately it's not always true sometimes an institutional uh, structure may not be necessary it becomes an unwanted uh, baggage and sometimes it works uh, definitely against the interest of the scientist he gets uh, tied down by many of the uh, requirements of an institutional backup it is always a problem for the science administrators when uh, scientific uh, infrastructure background is necessary what kind of infrastructural support is necessary and what kind of infrastructural support should not be provided so that the scientists will perform at its best we are having with us uh, professor jayanth narlika who is going to share his experiences with building scientific institutions this afternoon i hope he will also tell us how to build and now how not to build to this audience uh, jayanth narlika doesn't require an introduction he is very well known not only in this country but across the world as a leading uh, cosmologist astrophysicist whatever you want to call him and um, after his uh, early years in um, uk he returned to india to tata institute of fundamental research many of you in fact all of almost all of you must be aware of the contribution he made when he was in uk along with his uh, mentor red hoyle and an alternative to the big bang after his return to tfr as a head of the theoretical astrophysics group he was uh, he was instrumental in starting the inter university center astronomy and astrophysics in pune and uh, as you may recall that is that was one of the unique institutional structures you may say discovered in india i'm not sure whether there are many such uh, institutions anywhere in the world and um, i'm not a practicing astronomer so i really don't know i never visited uh, ayuka not many of very often maybe once or twice i visited them but i saw an practical um, impact of this when i was in the department of science and technology and there was an a proposal from one of the uh, cities in the bihar i think it was probably gorakhpur or somewhere and uh, one of the professors young professors came and submitted a proposal to dst uh, for support and the committee has recommended we are all always worried about institutions in bihar i said a person in this institution uh, a loan faculty member he submits a proposal in astronomy astrophysics and the committee recommends Yeah, this is somewhat uh, unusual so i want to listen so i ended up in the his presentation and he gave a very good presentation so there was no doubt he deserved it and he we got it he got it through then i called him aside i said tell me one thing you are sitting in that place from where you got into this astronomy astrophysic business he told me sir i am a regular visitor to ayuka whenever i get any vacation i go there i interact with the scientists there i also interact with other people like me there and over the last few years i am now in a position to write a, a research proposal and get it through a peer review i don't think you need anything a better certificate than this for the effectiveness of uh, ayuka and uh, today uh, when we are on the threshold of the 12th five year plan the planning commission is asking us if ayuka is such a success why are you not having too many ayukas in this country why there are only three inter university centers for the last 20 years why why are we not even replicating our success stories i think it's a very valid question and we have recommended at least 
a dozen Ayuka, Ayuka like institutions must come into existence in the country, spanning across uh, different uh, disciplines. And um, so effectively, it is learning from our successes. So that is what I expect to hear from Jayant Narlikar, what succeeded. And uh, while we are discussing successes, we'll also discuss uh, what we should not do. Purpose they learn out of our mistakes. And uh, just to complete his um, introduction, I must uh, mention, is one of the youngest uh, Padma Sri's of this country. I think he was probably uh, mid-20s when he got his Padma Sri. And subsequently, of course, he moved up to uh, Padma Bhushan and Padma Bhushan, I think. And uh, he's, he's again in the news now because uh, he's uh, looking for uh, uh, living organisms in the atmospheric, uh, upper layers of the atmospheric gap. In other words, he's going to tell us maybe in the next few years whether as, as we came, we, are, we came from outside the universe, outside the solar system, or uh, we developed on the, uh, on the bottom of the sea and moved up, I don't know. And that's what he will tell us. Not that it is uh, making a difference to me, but it makes a big difference to science, uh, the way life evolved in this, uh, and, um, in this uh, world. And, um, well, I think I shouldn't say, uh, I shouldn't take more time than this, Professor Nalika. Thank you, Professor Amurti, for your kind remarks. Today, uh, <clears throat> I want to share my experience of uh, being associated with three leading uh, scientific institutions. And two of them I saw come up uh, while I was a member there. And one was already established when I joined. So I will <coughs> talk about some issues which relate to the formation or foundation of scientific uh, institutions where people can come and do research. Actually, <coughs> if you look at the history of how science has developed over the last 100 years or so, you find <coughs> that initially it used to be individual oriented. Person would be working on his own problem in a lab and <coughs> publishing whatever interesting results he or she got. This was the pattern earlier. And <coughs> later, a phase transition came more or less after the Second World War, because the Manhattan Project, in which the atomic bomb was made by a team of scientists, uh, that set a pattern of <coughs> scientific in institutions where you have a group of scientists working together, exchanging ideas and mixing with visitors who would come and go to the, that institution. So this kind of uh, uh, suggestion that uh, you no longer have individuals working in isolation, but mixing with people, this idea became popular or was recognized to be effective uh, after the Second World War. So here, I want to now start my discussion. Uh, I don't know why it is stuck. OK, this way. I, I, I think, yeah, yes, that's all right. Uh, the uh, three scientific institutions that I will talk about, uh, the oldest one began as Cambridge Observatory, which represents the old way of doing research in astronomy. This is the Cambridge Observatory that <coughs> as the building is still there. And in the old days, the astronomer, the leading astronomer used to live in the observatory and uh, he would be available at any time, night and day, more useful at night than daytime. 
but <coughs> this observatory building is still there and has been of course internally redone and uh, modernized <coughs> but uh, the idea of moving away from that type of pattern came from Fred Hoyle when he wanted to set up what is called the Institute of what was called the Institute of Theoretical Astronomy <coughs> or if you take the initials it was well known as IOTA, I-O-T-A. And it existed <coughs> in its original form from 1966 to 1972. And Fred Hoyle realized that if England or Britain was to compete in astronomy, it needed a modern type of in institution. In, uh, in the olden times, although there were distinguished astronomers like Eddington, Jeans, and so on, <coughs> Larmor, etc., uh, they worked individually, and uh, that type of pattern, as I mentioned, had changed. So he felt that Cambridge should host uh, an institution which was, uh, as mentioned here, uh, should be dynamic visitor-oriented institute. Dynamic in the sense of organizing schools and workshops, uh, encouraging visitors to come, uh, give, uh, organize special lectures, all kinds of things. Uh, that a typical department in the university would not be able to do, partly for lack of funds, partly for the organizational structure, which did not allow uh, uh, so much freedom of uh, organization. So uh, Fred Hoyle wanted to set up such an institute, and in 1964, uh, by the way, I was his student from 1960 onwards. Uh, I got my PhD in 63. So I continued working as a uh, postdoctoral uh, fellow in uh, Cambridge, and I was still associated with him very closely. So in 1964, he had almost got the agreement from the British government to support the institute. But in 64, there was a general election, and the government changed. Uh, instead of the conservative government, uh, uh, labor government came. And <clears throat> the labor government had a uh, new policy of creating or supporting new universities. And their argument was that Cambridge and Oxford have already got a uh, lot of uh, endowments, lot of funds. So anything that the government wants to give should go towards these new universities which were coming all over. And <clears throat> this was in keeping with the change of view and the Labour government when it came into power uh, said that they will have to rethink the whole uh, uh, decision. And they uh, rethought it and said that the, uh, there should be an institute in astronomy, but it should not be in Cambridge. It should be in uh, Sussex. There was a u new university of Sussex, and uh, they said that it should be in, uh, in that university. <clears throat> and by way of additional support, they said that the historic Royal Greenwich Observatory was in Sussex. Uh, in Hurstmanso Castle, and not very far from the university. So they said that it would be good if the observers in the uh, observatory, uh, uh, RGO, Ra Royal Greenwich Observatory, had a uh, theoretical group uh, to uh, interact with, uh, and so it, is, it makes sense to have a center in, astronomy center in Sussex. And so they actually created the center in Sussex and invited Hoyle to be the first director. But Hoyle said that he was 
<coughs> not keen to go out of Cambridge. He wanted the center. That is, he was still <coughs> adamant that he, such a center should come in Cambridge, which had a very long tradition of scholastic work, and you get very bright students coming there. So he said, this is what should happen. So he <coughs> kept trying, and he went to private foundations, Nuffield and Wolfson Foundation. They uh, provided money in the sense that Wolfson said he, they will build the building, and Nafil said that they will support it for the first five years. So on that basis, um, uh, Fred Hoyle went ahead to the university and said, look, this is the money I have got. Now can you give me some land where I can build this institution? And the university managed to find land in a nice place, but it was very far from the Cavendish Lab, which is the physics center in Cambridge, uh, about uh, two to three miles from the center of Cambridge. So at that time, people said this institute will be very isolated where it is going to be built. But Hoyle felt that uh, uh, isolated or not, it should, should be built now that all parameters are fixed. So he went ahead. <coughs> uh, then about <coughs> 10 to 15 years later, there was a reorganization of uh, all the labs in Cambridge, and most of them moved out of their central position, location, to an area which is not very far from the Institute of Theoretical Astronomy. So where Hoyle had uh, put the institute, the rest of the science part moved. So it, it turned out to be a very good decision to have cited the institute there. <coughs> the other point that I want to mention was that a <coughs> few years later than that, the Royal Greenwich Observatory itself decided to move somewhere because it was no longer possible to sustain it in that big palatial environment of Hurstmansu Castle in Sussex. So they wanted to have a more compact building. And <clears throat> then they argued that there is a flourishing research center, namely the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge, so let us move next door to it. <laughs> so you see there are two different angles from which the decision to cite the institute in Cambridge was, uh, was justified. <clears throat> so in 1972, uh, IOTA was merged with the observatories, with the observatory which, whose picture I showed you became, it, and it turns out that it's just next door to the land which was given to Hoy. So the whole thing was <clears throat> very convenient to merge the center with the observatories. So up to 1972, uh, Nafield had agreed to pay uh, for the salaries of the people. So in 1966, when the center was started, uh, Hoyle was asked, what will you do if you don't get any money after 72? because Nafield had only for promised for five to six years. And so he said that by 72, the institute will either have been a great success, in which case money will not be a problem, or it will have failed, in which case it wouldn't matter if it no longer exists. So he would refuse to consider what will happen after five to six years. And he went along and fortunately the first alternative uh, happened, that is the institute became a great success. And as, as you see, the T was dropped when it was merged with the observatory. It was no longer confined to theoretical astronomy, both observational astronomy was there, 
So today it is known as IOA, uh, Institute of Astronomy. And uh, this is the present building, and that's Fred Hoyle uh, shown. Uh, so this building was uh, part of, the, was extended and made bigger uh, in the last few years to accommodate big, uh, greater de degree of activity. So the center has been a success and uh, uh, has justified the vision which Hoyle had in the 1960s. So from <coughs> there in 1972, I moved to uh, India and was fortunate to be associated with the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which was <coughs> uh, created in 1946, and uh, it moved to its present location. It went through a succession of temporary accommodations, but it came to the present location, which is the magnificent uh, seashore, uh, Arabian Sea, uh, in 1961. And <clears throat> it was uh, meant to be, I mean, it was started by Homi Bhava uh, with uh, a kind of vision which included uh, getting and nurturing talent for India's atomic energy program. and to emphasize fundamental research in nuclear science and mathematics. These were the areas which were uh, highlighted in the early times. <clears throat> and uh, another if possible uh, use of such an institution was that it will generate scientists which would go and work in universities in India. This was another uh, expectation. Uh, if we look back <coughs> on the way the institute has functioned, you find that the, uh, certainly it has provided uh, the uh, talent for atomic energy program and was, has very close links with the Bhava Atomic Research Center. And it has been a <coughs> place which where nuclear science and mathematics have flourished and more subjects have come up under the same uh, umbrella. So uh, molecular biology and uh, astronomy, astrophysics, they have uh, come under the same umbrella. Uh, but this last aspect, the source of scientists for universities, that has not happened, that is my view. Uh, that means people uh, who were trained as scientists in Tata Institute felt that they would rather continue there rather than move to universities and face some of the ground realities uh, in the university sector. And so uh, <coughs> the university, in fact, uh, in a negative sense, some of the talent which would have normally worked in the universities was attracted by IFR and uh, therefore the universities were in a sense deprived. Uh, we have distinguished people here who have been associated with TIFR for longer period than I have and they can uh, in the discussion comment on this particular remark. So this is the <coughs> modern building uh, of TIFR and Homi Bhabha who was the uh, visionary who created this institution. So uh, I, I, I now come to my third institution, which was in answer to the last issue which I mentioned that from t place like TIFR, not uh, many people went to universities or enriched the university sector. <coughs> So how to do this? Uh, can the university sector be <coughs> helped uh, in a <coughs> significant way by establishing a 
Center for Excellence in the University Sector. This was the issue uh, which the UGC, University Grants Commission, uh, raised in the 1980s. What happened was, as, you, as I mentioned, the TIFR was mentioned specifically by me because I was a member of it and I could see it firsthand. But after the independence or around the independence time, uh, there were a number of uh, research, autonomous research institutions or laboratories which were created all around, all over India, that is CSI labs, defense labs, and so on. They were all outside the university sector. They provided uh, excellent working conditions for research scientists uh, dedicated to specific subjects which the laboratory was supposed to uh, encourage. So you had these different labs and everything was provided for to make uh, life easier for the research worker working in the universe in that uh, laboratory <clears throat> but the universities uh, in comparison began to suffer there were more and more political uh, uh, interferences and so on so uh, for example i mean this this i can see from my personal uh, observation that I was brought up as a uh, child in the campus of Banaras Hindu University and Banaras Hindu University provided many <coughs> scientists in fact who came to TIFR there are many ex-BHU uh, scientists in TIFR so it, it had a tradition of good all around, all, uh, in all subjects, uh, scholastic nature. But the standards have steadily deteriorated. Although the funding situation has improved, but the quality that one would like to have from a central university, that is lacking not only in BHU, but in many of the uh, central universities. So, <clears throat> This is the situation, and uh, when this pro uh, proposal to create uh, Ayuka, which was Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, it's a very long name, so it became uh, <coughs> shortened to the acronym, and uh, everybody seems to know, uh, know it as Ayuka. After some time, I, my fear is that you could ask a question in the uh, quiz, scientific quiz, what does IUCA stand for? And most people won't know what it stands for. So, but anyway, so long as they know what the center is doing, that is more important than knowing its full name. So, uh, the UGC felt that they should have their own system of centers which will help bring up excellence in the university sector, support excellence. And they decided to, uh, on a trial basis, uh, to have some three uh, in IUCs, which uh, Professor Ramurthy mentioned. And uh, Ayuka was selected to be one of them for astronomy and astrophysics. The basic idea was the following. You select a subject area which is not supported well in universities. So if you want to support the area well in a university, what you need to do is to provide a lot of facilities. And it might become very expensive if you begin to provide the same facilities to all universities because what will happen if you give it to one university, others will say, why only this university, why not to us? So you give, if you start replicating it, <coughs> uh, it costs quite a lot. And then the question comes, uh, do you have enough staff members and students to use that facility? Now the university may not have so many students and uh, staff members interested in that particular subject area. 
and so it becomes <coughs> a kind of situation where you've got uh, abundance of riches but nobody to share them or use them. So to avoid this situation from happening, the idea was to create one center which is used on a shared basis by all universities. So wherever that particular subject needs to be supported, the uh, university could approach this center and say that uh, we are interested in uh, growing this area, please help us, and the center would help. This was the idea that on a shared basis, you have limited resources reaching out uh, far enough. So <clears throat> this was the idea proposed by Yashpal, again a TIFR product, but uh, outside TIFR. And at that time, he was uh, having gone to various other uh, important positions. He was, at that time, the chairman of the University Grants Commission. So he felt that astronomy astrophysics is an area which could be made into an inter-university center. And so <coughs> he uh, suggested to me uh, to <coughs> come up and uh, do uh, the job of setting up this type of center. Now, I remember when he <coughs> uh, asked me to do this, uh, he said that you have to come by cutting off all your links with TIFR because he was very well aware that people go on deputation from TIFR to universities. They uh, survive for a couple of years and then they realize that things are not so easy and then they come back. And if they have kept a lien at uh, TIFR, uh, they, there is no difficulty in the coming back. So <clears throat> he said, you cannot have any lien uh, in uh, TIFR. Uh, you have to resign and go. Are you willing? And he also said, if you are not willing to come, I am not going to sanction this, approve this uh, center. So it was left to me to decide uh, over a telephone call uh, whether to accept this challenge or not. And I said, I, uh, I will take that challenge and let us see how, how we proceed. So <clears throat> this was sometime uh, in 1988. And uh, uh, then the things began to move fairly fast. What we did was we first had a series of brainstorming meetings with scientists from uh, universities, from TIFR, from other institutions. So we sat around the table and discussed how this center should be formulated. Because, as Professor Ramurthy said, it, it was a new model. There was not a, any particular model to copy here. So uh, this was... Uh, done. We prepared a project document and that project document was given to UGC that this is how the center should be formulated, uh, how its various programs will be and what it, uh, uh, how much area of uh, work it is needed, how much uh, sir, uh, uh, the campus, how big the campus should be, etc. So this is the project report. And we, you see here uh, the uh, different uh, activities which this center was supposed to do. As I said, it was a new model, so it was not just doing research uh, its stuff. It was not a research institute only, but it had to do pedagogical work. It had to organize schools and workshops. Uh, it had to help people with observing with telescopes. It had the next door to us, uh, there was a, a major uh, radio telescope coming up. So one should be involved in uh, the development of that telescope also. So there were 
uh, several of these things that, uh, and since there were eight, uh, we called it Ayuka's Eightfold Way uh, to what we are supposed to do. So uh, this <coughs> consisted of create a high level academic ambience at its Pune headquarters with emphasis on basic research and facilities conducive to it. Now you notice the word Pune has come in. Uh, the radio telescope, which TIFR had uh, started building, uh, was about 80, 90 kilometers from Pune. And uh, it was going to be managed by a uh, research center created by TIFR in Pune University campus. So Yashpal said we should try to get next door to the uh, TIFR center, which uh, was going to run the radio telescope. Strategically, that would have been very good. So uh, there were all kinds of difficulties in getting the land that we wanted, but finally we succeeded. That itself is a uh, long story, but I will not tell you here. But uh, it happened uh, finally in a uh, in the way we wanted. Then we want uh, another part of the eightfold way was to organize research level workshops and schools for universities, both in Pune and university campuses. So, in order to introduce new research areas, we needed to uh, have workshops where experts would lecture and faculty or uh, students from universities would attend. Then we also wanted to run an associateship program under which users from the universities can come and use our facilities at Pune and also encourage other academics to visit and participate in Ayuka's program. Now this is where we were copying uh, the Abdus Salam's Institute in Trieste, which has an associateship program and uh, that institute uh, has a scope of theoretical physics into which people from uh, developing countries can go and if you have this associateship program, uh, identified staff members can visit that center and their fares and uh, living expenses are paid. So we were uh, use, going to copy that part and uh, translate it to the Indian university system that staff members from universities can come and use our facilities as and when they want it, provided they are associates. That is, they have been already selected after some kind of uh, criteria based on how useful their work they are doing or are capable of doing. Then we also <coughs> we are going to we are going to organize research uh, refresher courses for teachers so that when they teach the subject they are teaching up to date in uh, giving up to date information. Then guide universities in creating new courses uh, in astronomy astrophysics and or uh, augmenting existing ones. This is again part of the teaching system uh, getting modernized. Then we wanted to run a graduate school at Ayuka in which graduate students from Ayuka as well as from universities and colleges can participate. So in addition, lec lecture in MSc programs of other universities was encouraged by uh, Ayuka staff to go and give lectures. Then <coughs> we also wanted to use and act as facilitator for universities in the usage of giant meter wave radio telescope in Pune. So it was expected that the radio telescope will be completed and then people would like to use it and universities from India should also be users of this very important facility. Then another thing was to act as a facilitator for university users in observing programs at other facilities in India and abroad. So if you take a major telescope, take for example the 
uh, eight meter telescope in of ESO, European Southern Observatory. There is a certain amount of time available to outside users, but you must have a good program to write and get it. And uh, we wanted to uh, have universities from India compete in this and submit programs which can be used. And uh, this began to happen after a few years, and that was what Professor Ramurthy mentioned uh, in the case of DST proposals also. So <clears throat> just to give you a brief history, uh, things moved very fast. In September 87, the basic idea mooted in consultation with Professor Yashpal at IUT 8 April. UGC approved the idea formally and the project report was prepared. November 88, the Government of India approved the setting up of Ayuka. Then December 19, this is not 98, it is 1988. There is a mistake of a decade. Uh, Ayuka's foundation stone was laid by Professor Yashpal. Uh, and the, that, that you see there, uh, Professor Yashpal, myself, and the Vice Chancellor of Pune University. Professor Takole, and uh, we functioned from a single room in this bungalow for the early few months. So this, there was only one room, and with a few uh, chairs and a table, and our uh, invitation to the users was, whoever comes in first will get the chairs and tables, the rest would have to sit on the steps outside. So. The, in this fashion, when we worked, uh, then later we uh, decided to build uh, a shed of 2,000 uh, uh, square feet, and we felt, oh, what luxury that we have so much area. And I should mention that the foundations of the digging for this was done by Professor Srikantan when he uh, was visiting uh, us uh, or visiting Pune, we said uh, we would like to start the whole building process with it at your hand. So I'm glad to see that he is present here. So this was used uh, on this side, there was uh, a state of the art computer put here, and on this side, there were administrative staff sitting there. Meanwhile, next door. The TIFR Center had uh, some rooms for us, uh, for academics to use, fortunately. So uh, everything worked out well. Uh, so in December 1990, uh, we moved to the uh, constructed staff colony. We first constructed the uh, staff colony before we constructed the main building of Ayoka, because uh, from my experience of TIFR, I knew that they built this magnificent building with all facilities for working, but the staff quarters took much longer to build because they were not given that level of priority. So I thought if we reverse the priorities, if we build the staff quarters first, uh, after we build it, uh, sometimes what happens is the funding agency says, sorry, we will." We don't have as many funds now. But they can't say that to the main building, which has got all the research facilities. So you first get the easy money to build your staff quarters, and then um, uh, go back to the funding agency and say, that. So, so now we need the money for the main thing. So this <coughs> fortunately worked. And the other point was, you may say, you have built staff quarters, but where was your staff? So aren't you wasting space? The answer is no. What we did was we moved all the offices, library, every computer, to these empty staff quarters. And we used them till our main accommodation was done. So this way, uh, nothing was wasted, everything was used. And uh, people began to uh, uh, work as new people were appointed. Uh, we, it was all done in a phased manner, so the, some quarters were vacated and the 
stuff could be moved to the main building. So this happened, and in December 1992, uh, a lecture was given by uh, the Professor Chandrasekhar uh, on uh, uh, a topic to uh, inaugurate the uh, new buildings, and Professor Ram Reddy, the chairman, UGC, was presiding. Now, the process of inauguration also, we chose a rather unusual method. We have a Foucault's pendulum in the center, which is a pendulum which changes its direction because of the Earth's spin. So it moves at a specified rate. And it's supposed to keep oscillating forever. So you, of course, give uh, an electrical impulse to keep it going, otherwise friction will slow it down. So what we did was we started the whole process with Professor Chandrasekhar setting the pendulum in motion. So it was a symbolic way of saying that Ayuka has started. And <clears throat> of course, uh, the idea is that that pendulum should never stop, which given the uh, power situation, we sometimes uh, had stoppages which we could have, couldn't avoid, but later on we put everything on uh, uh, UPS and everything worked all right. Then uh, in 1993, uh, we had Chandrasekhar Auditorium completed. Now there is one other trick which I wanted to share with you that uh, unless you give a specific deadline, things in India don't get completed. Now, in 1992, December, uh, <clears throat> by all accounts, we were uh, expecting that the building should be completed. So in July, I wrote to Professor Chandrasekhar and said, would you be available to, to visit us uh, in December, towards the end of December in, uh, in the year? So he very kindly agreed to come. So then I told my contractor that Professor Chandrasekhar is coming and we better have everything ready. So he <coughs> said, yes, yes, I, I will be through, he said, even one month ahead of that time. But <coughs> one shouldn't take such uh, time limits uh, very seriously in India because you never know what will happen. And <coughs> the Bombay riots came in December. and. Some of the uh, workers who were going to do the uh, outside uh, stonework, they came from an area which was under curfew, they could not move out. So we had this problem that as the date 29th uh, or 28th of December approached, uh, things were not improving and how to get those uh, artisans to come. Uh, we kept telling them we'll offer you all safety and but they said no sir we can't move out from here. Finally they came uh, the day before the inauguration and they completed the job working overnight and I remember our architect Charles Correa he was anxiously surveying this completion job because he also wanted everything to look completed rather than half done. Similarly, in August 1993, <clears throat> when Chandrasekhar Auditorium was completed, uh, three years prior to that, I had issued an invitation to the International Astronomical Union to hold their Asia-Pacific meeting in Ayoka. So uh, this was in 1990. They said, what buildings do you have? So I said, nothing. <laughs> because in 1990, there was nothing ready. But we, the, so they were very uh, doubtful whether to approve the invitation or not. So uh, I said, no, no, we will get it done, we'll promise you. And this auditorium was a crucial part of the whole process. And we managed to get it done two days to go. And to test it, I gave a talk to school children two days before the day, that is the auditorium was ready to test the acoustics. So now in Pune, 
we have <coughs> the facilities. These are the uh, guest house. So people who come from universities have one minute commuting time from their room to the office where they work. Uh, one minute on foot. Then uh, you, you have also mirror sites of uh, uh, data centers, astronomy data centers, a very excellent library. Then we have instrumentation laboratory where university people can come and consume, build instruments and get uh, guidance in doing so, by that. And <coughs> here we uh, played TIFR in its own game, uh, just as it uh, snatched talent from universities, we snatched talent from TIFR to bring to Ayuka. So uh, Shyam Tandon, who is an excellent uh, guide for instrumentation, uh, he agreed to uh, join Ayuka, and that is how things became very easy. We have now a two-meter telescope, uh, which you see here, uh, about 80 kilometers from Ayuka. This is the Ayuka <coughs> logo, uh, which uh, means two things. One is, uh, this is an, uh, we are solving an unending cosmic puzzle. It has no beginning, no end. We don't know where to begin, where to end. And the other is linkages. We are linked to the university system. So uh, this is the uh, uh, logo prepared by Kirti Trivedi from IIT Bombay. Then this is the Foucault's pendulum, which uh, uh, moves in this well and uh, uh, has been doing very well. This is a fractal triangle, uh, which uh, if you know uh, how to make it, it, draw an equilateral triangle and divide it into four equal equilateral triangles, put a lawn in the middle. The remaining triangles, you again take the middle triangle, put a lawn in, the, in it, and go on doing it ad infinitum. You don't do it ad infinitum in reality, but after you have done it four times, uh, you begin, you get the idea, and it's a, it's called C.S. Pinsky's gasket, and it's a, uh, figure of dimensionality to uh, something like one and a half, two and a half. It's not a, a one-dimensional or two-dimensional figure. Then this is uh, uh, a picture of black hole accretion disk uh, on this. And there are statues, four statues of scientists, uh, Aryabhat, Galileo, Newton, and Einstein, uh, more than life-size. And then there were two banyan trees, which the architect uh, said uh, he wouldn't like to pull them down. In fact, most banyan trees in the campus, we moved bodily from one place to another where they were not affected by building construction. So we saved all these nearly 40 banyan trees. Now here you see these. Uh, two banyan trees, and so uh, Ajit Kembhavi had the idea to have a accretion disk, no, not accretion disk, accretion, that is part of it, but a double star system. Uh, each tree is a star going around the other, so uh, you have a Roche lobe, which are equipotential surfaces which are drawn uh, to in that figure. So th this is an astronomical exhibit, in short. Then here in the auditorium, the, the base had a uh, asymmetrical tiling, which is not very clear from here. But Roger Penrose had uh, written a book, uh, Emperor's New Mind, in which he had shown uh, how somebody has found uh, tiles which are uh, not sh shaped like hexagons or squares, but uh, rather strange shape, but they fit very well into each other. Then this is the uh, model of the Milky Way, a spiral galaxy uh, built into the garden. So all these things are uh, uh, 
what Ayuka has been doing, the pedagogical program. And one of its in interesting aspects is that it's, it has public outreach program very well established. Uh, you see here a science park. And this maze here uh, is a copy of the Hampton Court Palace maze. If you go to London and visit Hampton Court, you'll see a maze there. Once you get into it, it's difficult to come out, but there is a trick of coming out. Here you see children lining up for, school children lining up for lectures on sat second Saturday of the month. So here the auditorium is full of children listening to some lectures. Then they keep asking questions afterwards, so the lecturer explains. Here you see other situations. So what we are doing is uh, uh, also, uh, as you see here, amateur astronomers in, India, in Pune, they collaborate with us on important occasions when we invite public for night viewing. And here you see the big crowds which assemble on National Science Day when there are open house for uh, Ayuka. So people ask questions and children are explaining it. So this is where I will stop. And anything more you want to draw out from me, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. Questions were here but disappointed. And I was disappointed on that. No, something, something you will say. I, this is, this is, this should have happened. It didn't happen. <laughs> I'm sure there are many occasions like that where you are frustrated, but maybe you don't want to share it in public. Even I can tell you. <laughs> no, uh, when when I was Hoyle's student, uh, he had bought some computing time on IBM. 1790, which was the state-of-the-art electronic computer in 1960s. And he said, you have to go to London to uh, run, uh, run it. And they would not allow you to play with the computer. So you had to go with the whole cards set and give it to them. They will run the whole thing and tell you after two or three hours whether it worked or not, or what was wrong. So uh, very often some silly mistake would happen, uh, in which case their operator would correct it. But otherwise you had to go next week and do it again. So this, through this process, we managed to do our work. Now when Ayuka was being built, as I mentioned, we had this computer in the Aditi, that uh, shed building. And when I moved the uh, students to the housing, they had to walk about 200 meters to the, uh, to the uh, what you call the, the, the computer center. So they said, they started complaining, we, we had to walk 200 meters. <laughs> so, so I told them this story, what, what had, how I had, as a graduate student, to go from Cambridge to London and uh, use that computer. So uh, these kind of uh, things happen. Uh, you don't budget for it. People uh, have to be uh, appeased. <laughs> What's your feeling with regard to the response from university uh, teaching staff and the younger people with regard to pursuing studies in astronomy? Uh, do you find there is a big upswell or is it an uphill battle to interest people? Well, I think there has been certainly a phase transition in terms of interest which universities, students or staff have shown in astronomy and astrophysics. And the number of places where this subject is now being taught is quite appreciable. Although I wouldn't say that uh, if you take 200 as the number of universities, now of course the 
we deem the university the number is yeah, uh, semi infinite but but still the major universities uh, i would say about 30 40 universities are doing serious job so this has been a good response uh, also at school children level because of our, all our activities there is an awareness of astronomy being a, a, a vibrant part of science and some, many of them are interested in their appearing in astronomy olympiads and some of them end up doing astronomy so this does happen uh, i would not be satisfied with the numbers i would say more num more should do uh, in fact once you are satisfied then that is the end of the <laughs> end of you i would say so i am not satisfied I, but whatever is there is worth uh, encouraging further efforts last 5 years in india um, helping uh, young scientists get research orientation and helping them learn how to publish papers. Uh, what moral uh, do you have from your, your experience in promoting research orientation in undergraduates and postgraduates in India? I think... Well, uh, when I, I get a lot of letters with, in which uh, peop, uh, students or uh, others uh, not not just students others also uh, s send their work for my evaluation now so many of those manuscripts i immediately send back saying that there is no mathematical uh, calculation in it and no reference to any physical observation so i am not able to understand what you are saying See, I want to emphasize in a very strong way that unless you are using uh, the technical uh, mathematics and physics into your work, you should not expect it to get published or publicized. So uh, that is one class. Another class which say which have done reasonable work, I tell them which journal they could send it to. And I tell them that... Uh, the journal will have a peer review and will tell you what will be uh, possible and what is not possible with your ideas. So usually that is how I operate. Good evening, sir. Oh, I'm doing my graduate. After my graduate, if I have to do my, I want to do my MSc, how can I get through Ayuka? Well, in Ayuka, we take students uh, for PhD. So they, they can be MSCs in physics or mathematics, or they can be BE, BTEC from engineering colleges or IIT. Uh, in the second eventuality, if they are BE, BTEC, we have an arrangement with Pune University so that they can first do two years of MSc physics partly by paper, partly by, uh, by project. So uh, while they are joining Ayuka, first two years they spend in this way and get qualified for MSc. But in the meantime, they are already, if they are very good, uh, they already are working on some research problem. So they don't lose time after they get this MSc degree. If they are MSc physics, already, then they can immediately start on uh, their Ayuka's graduate school, one year graduate school, and then they are able to continue their research. So this is the way one can join Ayuka. I would like to know, do you think the scientific research in India is going at the pace which you had expected, and is it in the right direction? And is the quality improving or deteriorating? Well, I don't think I can answer for all subjects in science, but in astronomy, astrophysics, when I joined TIFR in 1972, the number of papers or the quality of papers that was published and what is being published now, I think there is a great deal of improve has been a great deal of improvement. 
since 1972 to now. You see a lot of papers in very good refereed journals. Then similarly, there are uh, <coughs> observations in international observatories, uh, which uh, Indian astronomers have accessed. So I think it's, it, things have improved. Uh, it, given the uh, uh, benefit of uh, what I would call lo looking into future, uh, I would say that we need much more than what has been there. <clears throat> because if you are asking for, <coughs> and I think <coughs> there is a proposal to go partners in a 30 meter telescope. That is a telescope whose main mirror has the diameter of 30 meters. It's a huge telescope. So the question is, uh, who is going to use it if you build it uh, from Indian side? Each, there are several na nations participate in the project and it, correspondingly they will get time to use it. So if India gets say 10% of the time, can Indian astronomers fill up that time? Do they, are there enough good works? So we will need to create more talent So in spite of the good work being uh, done by the centers like Ayuka, Indian society is more swayed by astrology and uh, many of the uh, development and programs are affected by belief in astrology. Don't you think that centers like Ayuka has a role in, uh, should play a major role in debunking astrological beliefs and uh, start a kind of movement towards that? Well, we, we have been doing this in, as part of our public outreach program. Uh, but uh, <coughs> I think it is not uh, enough for what we are doing. Uh, more people have to do it. And the uh, trend which makes me a little more apprehensive is that the younger generation today is more uh, superstitious than we were, <laughs> in spite of all these so uh, it, it's like in Alice in Wonderland or through the looking glass that uh, it is the, uh, through the looking that the Red Queen says that you have to keep running very fast in order to stay in the same place. So <laughs> we, we have to keep working very hard in order to not let the situation get worse. But that is the problem. Mm -hmm. I thought I would say something about Harvard University. Yes. See, when Baba came back from Cambridge, mm. and he, as you know, spent six years in IIS, he was offered professorships at uh, Baba University. He was offered a professorship at Baba University. And he was already working in IIS. But for the kind of research he wanted to do, yeah. for the ambitious program that he had, he had explained all these things better in the very first letter they are the and others, their conditions are not good in universities. And even at IAS, I know in the very first year when I got when I joined, my grant was one lakh and fifties for the work which I was doing. Mm. Whereas the university the department of physics in IAS had a grant of times cost of physics. So it is miserable condition at that time more the university and okay, so I don't think we
this actually relates to Professor Shikantan's question also, is that one of the endemic problems of modern Indian educational institutions is that whenever we find a problem in one institution, rather than solve that, our policy is always to start another institution. <laughs> and in fact, the genesis of most institutions is in the problems of others, rather than saying that is, there's a specific reason why we want to start it. So in the same way, people who come as associates to IOCA from their parent universities will obviously feel a big cultural shock when they go back to their parent institutions. So is there some way that we can in, uh, fix the problems of the original institution, institution itself rather than every time start a new center which doesn't have the baggage of the old institutions because in this process we otherwise create a legacy of large number of institutions which are substandard. Well, uh, first coming to Professor Shrikantan's comment, I agree with you. In fact, when I showed what the TIFR had set out to do amongst Baba's vision, uh, the, I, I mentioned that the first two things that were required were done very well. But the third part where the universities were to benefit, uh, the, the university part uh, has not benefited. Uh, so it is, it is not that Baba should have gone to a university. Then, of course, nothing would have happened in spite of Baba. But so the fact that he could create a center which produced a lot of talent. That talent, some of them could have been uh, beneficial to universities, but didn't happen. I'm not blaming that talent, but because the university conditions were also not too good to go there. So. And <clears throat> about your thing, the associates who come to Ayuka, they are coming for like two, three weeks, four weeks, uh, so they are it's not a big culture shock. They are still working within their own university system. But coming for something like a catalytic interaction with Ayuka. And so... They carry the culture back. Yeah. And they take some of the uh, good things that they learn back to their department. Some of them we have now introduced uh, in four or five places uh, resource centers which are uh, local uh, versions of Ayoka. That means in the, so if you take, say, Siliguri North Bengal University or Raipur, uh, in the local region, the academics can come to Raipur and get some of the benefits which they would have got at Ayoka. So this saves them travel and expense. So we are trying to multiply the effect and it has become a worthwhile job. Uh, Professor Narlikar, you mentioned about the success of Ayuka, and it was also mentioned that uh, there is a need for many such institutes like Ayuka. I just want to know what are the areas where you think you know the institutes like like Ayuka could be established, and uh, you know university and other scientific community could be benefited from that. Thank you. Well, uh, I think <coughs> I, I have not done my homework properly, but very recently Planning Commission had got some exercise done on what subjects IUCs could be created in, and uh, a list of subjects had been proposed for consideration. Uh, so th they would be uh, because people began to realize that uh, the, uh, so far these three IUCs are all in physics. So <laughs> physicists were quietly getting the benefit. What about other subjects? So uh, it is certainly possible to think of subjects which are not properly covered in universities but which are important enough. And uh, some of those have been listed, but I don't have it here, that information. <laughs> you can 
I'd like to make I'll answer ask a general question about institution building. So, you know, it's obvious that in a large country like that, you need many kinds of institutions. One kind of institution will not do. Older universities were very good when they were reasonable size and people had time. And therefore, people could pursue research and also do teaching, and large amount of teaching, but they were not overburdened with social responsibility, shall I say. Science research institutes here were built mostly for doing uh, specialized research in a particular particular area and so on and so forth, national laboratories. And what has happened over these years is a new development has taken place that most of the science institutes have dis discovered that as a purely research institute, they are not doing very well. And therefore, they are gradually changing to all becoming teaching institutions, but they are elite graduate school teaching institutions with very small number of students. And to the extent that they can combine uh, research, which is time consuming, expensive resource consuming, and teaching and training. And in between, there are various combinations. My question is that seems to me there is something missing in and building an institution which is a monoculture based on one discipline and making it easy in that institution for people to do what like. And at the same time, it is dangerous to build an institution which will try to do too many things and take too many people. What is your opinion? I have been watching, I have been involved in going and looking at the new universities that are being, which are being set up, the so-called ISERs. Okay. Are ISERs going to be similar to research institutes with three subjects or four subjects? Or are they going to be universities which will uh, work to educate people in a larger sense? I would like to know your opinion. Well, first, uh, coming for this uh, for teaching and research with, uh, aspect, uh, I wanted to mention that, uh, I, for, in fact, I should have mentioned it during my lecture, that when Cambridge University was considering Hoyle's proposal for institute of theoretical astronomy, and it organized a general discussion among staff members. This is the custom of Cambridge to have a general board discussion where they tell you, uh, the staff express, I mean, not staff means any university member will speak. And George Batchelor, who was against Fred Hoyle's proposal, he said that he will support the institute coming into existence, provided the members of the institute do not teach in the mathematical tribe, or do not teach. Okay. So uh, at that time, I was uh, expecting to join the institute as a postdoc. So I thought this is a good thing he's asking not to burden the, uh, uh, the staff members to with teaching. So uh, I was a little surprised, but Fred said, no, this is a real uh, problem. If you don't teach, you won't get good students. And if you don't get good students, your research uh, atmosphere gets spoiled. So uh, Bachelor is trying to weaken the uh, intake of students, because what would happen then, the students will go more to the conventional mathematics or physics departments, and they won't come to the institute. So he, Fred was very keen that teaching and research were went hand in hand uh, in the institute, and it subsequently happened that way. Now, uh, it is found that many of the research labs have no teaching, so they don't have contact with the undergraduate population. And therefore, there is uh, is lack of communication between the student population and places where good research is being done. And so the students don't feel the, the excitement of doing science. Whereas if you take a U.S. campus or Cambridge, you see staff members who are teaching you doing very good re research. And so you feel that you would like to do something like what they are doing. and. 
this aspect I find missing in our research centers. This is all I can say. Uh, are you playing a major part in the combination of combining the improvements in technology to imp uh, advancing instrumentation for better astronomical observation, which is what has made great advances in astronomy possible in the last 30 years. I, I, uh, I, I, I speak as a retired, uh, my name is T. Krishnan. I'm a retired radio astronomer, you may have heard of me. And everything from aperture synthesis to interferometry has been extended even to optics and to other areas. Is some of this background, which is interdisciplinary, has to be combined with astronomy. Does Ayuka play a part in this? Well, in our instrumentation program, we have produced good instruments and some of them are original uh, and have been used in observing with the telescopes in India. So I th think uh, it has been a good, uh, it has made a good impact on the overall pattern of uh, research in astronomy. That it has given some boost to the instrumentation side. Normally people tend to be more theorists in astronomy, but to encourage the instrumentation side. This effort has been successful, I think. While uh, uh, most feel uh, that the basic science is fundamental for the growth of a nation, but now in the last uh, uh, couple of decades, the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, there has been an upsurge in the uh, teenagers to move into the uh, engineering faculties and uh, the medical faculty, but uh, not many are coming into the mainstream of uh, uh, the science. Uh, as policymakers, what uh, do you think uh, the country should do so that uh, uh, the nation is in the right uh, path? I, th I think there is some help towards reversing that trend which you mentioned by the creation of uh, ICERs and NICERS, the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research and National Institute of Singh. Uh, several, I think seven, eight of these institutes have come and they are getting good students. And since the emphasis is there on uh, basic science, one hopes that this will produce some uh, good students for PhD. What do you see as the main problems faced by our uh, universities? Is it in funding or is it in governance or, as you said, is it in uh, political interference? Uh, in other words, what are the prospects for uh, 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 Cambridge University or a University of California, Berkeley, um, arising in India? <laughs> yeah. I, I think, <clears throat> well, I, I, I will give you one uh, answer, which is which may not answer your question, but uh, I once asked my father, who was professor at Banaras Hindu University for many years, as to what his impression was of the evolution of the university. So he said that until 1947, when we were not uh, free a nation. Uh, BHU was supported by donations from people and the British government did not, or although they were called Government of India, but the British government, they did not give money <coughs> to the university uh, for political reasons, or they suspected the national movements are breeding there and so forth. But when BHU, so all the teachers who came there were more dedicated with the desire to teach and not by the fact that how much money is available and so on. So they worked on shoestring budget. When it became a national, declared, was declared a national university and its funds improved enormously then people who were not so academically minded became 
interested in joining and the atmosphere became bad. So it, it, it's a reflection on how easy it is to get money <laughs> that can sometimes change the mindset. Thank you, sir. Very good lecture. We are feeling that good students are not coming towards the CSIR or any academic organization or research organization for do the good research. One question. Most of the brilliant students moving towards the money, sake of MBA doing to the other business. Third question, the evaluation of university level students our old pattern was good, our semester system is good. A debate is going on in India also over TV and other things. What should be a best method to judge a good student? Thank you, sir. I have no answer to this, sorry. Sir, my query pertains to the outreach program, not necessarily of IUCA. Uh, we have, we are here as a trainee, and I have heard around 11 lectures so far. Uh, one of the faculty observed, of course, in response to that scientists are not coming forward to join debates related to science of controversial nature. The issue was uh, raised in relation to Bt cotton, genetically modified crops. Jayatapur nuclear plants. Perhaps scientists, and this was one uh, class. The next class, in the rest query to what government can do for this, how we can encourage scientists to join the debates of national importance, where public ought to be educated on certain issues. Now the response came that scientists are not only shy of, as you said, many of them are not confident enough to interact with the public, the language they understand the best. Apart from that, the activists of other side are so aggressive that the kind of language they use Scientists are no match to that, so much so that even they are physically threatened. Given in this scene, I would like to know from you what government can do to encourage the scientists to join the debates of public interest. Well, in some cases, the national academies express a view and uh, there are some issues on which uh, through the academies, some if views are conveyed. But government as such cannot do much to tell scientists, you go and talk and you go and talk. This, this is, a, I, I don't think uh, this is not going to work. The scientists should feel the urge to go and speak in public forum. Some scientists do on some issues, some keep quiet. So, that is my feeling. I, I think if some of these distinguished scientists here can express a view, it would be better. This is with regard to your uh, uh, question that was asked about there being the possibility of generating a Cambridge University in India. With a 1.2 billion population, I could see India producing as much research as the United States, North America, and Europe combined. Pre pre President, ex-President Abdul Kalam gave that vision in his 2020 vision of India. What can be done to activate that vision? 
what, what, what kind of vision can Ayuka and Ayukas um, supply to make the, the, to transform the Indian universities from the repression and the abolition of research by the British into something which is going beyond the TFIR um, models so that all universities get a research orientation. I, that was the implication of my first question. I would need to set it in this global and visionary context. But I, I truly think that India needs that vision, that it's been supplied, but it needs everyone to activate it. I, I have no ready-made answer for that. But yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Professor, uh, what is uh, generally uh, India's role in the TMT project uh, that you uh, mentioned, uh, whether it be building hardware or software on the real sciences? What is, uh, what is the role of India? The TMT project? The 30 meter telescope project? 30 meter telescope project? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was my first question. The second question is uh, in India, is there a, a role in science uh, that is uh, played by people like Richard Dawkins or Peter Atkins in, in the UK. Uh, they, 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 they held the chairs for the public understanding of science. Are there similar roles in India? Public understanding of science, you have Sri Gyan Prasad. Gyan Prasad, yeah, but I would always see that Jayan Panarlika is my mother. Well, um, what was the first? So, 30 meters 30. plus four, what do you expect? To yeah. Well, 30 meter telescope project, which was uh, you raised, the um, idea is that um, such a telescope will be made and placed in a site which, which is the best possible site for such a telescope. <coughs> but it will be <coughs> uh, maintained and uh, uh, built by uh, several nations together, put together. So one nation cannot afford to spend money on that telescope, so you buy your share. Uh, so supposing you say that you will pay for 10% of the total cost, then there is some method of evaluation of how you contribute. Sometimes you make an instrument or deal with making the mirrors in a particular way. So this will be evaluated and so you can offer to do so much, uh, preferably in kind, because in kind is something that encourages your own instrument making ability. So it, it has a fallback, I mean feedback on your other activities, so it helps. So rather than just giving cash for so the, what scientists in India are trying to do is to make out how much they can contribute. And minimum, I think, they expect you to contribute is 10%. So if you contribute 10% in terms of uh, this cash and kind together, then you will get 10% of the observing time, which Supposing the, uh, two, there are 200 nights, then observing time you will get is 20 nights. Now 20 nights on the 30 meter telescope is an enormous um, observing time. You really need good proposals to see, uh, to use it effectively. So uh, although you, you will get this time, do you, if you have not worked to produce enough science for or using it, uh, then this money is wasted. So it is necessary uh, for India to produce uh, scientists, young scientists, who will be, say, in eight years' time, which, which is the time taken for this telescope to be completed. They should be able to produce good questions to be tested by this telescope. So that, that is the uh, issue. Sir, at a time, 
much advanced, but did not take place in computers, then you have built these centers. Now, is it not the right time instead of uh, building these IT parts, we should have more institutions like this, sir? Instead of building IT parts, should we have more IUPA like this? <laughs> I think uh, inter university centers should be built uh, or <coughs> should be made in other subjects wherever there is a need. You know, so I, I'm sure there are needs for other subjects which where IUCs can be used. Uh, Professor Nalikar, I just wanted to take the opportunity to really also congratulate you for the way you've set about also trying to integrate some of these, you know, simple, maybe astronomical ideas in, into the aesthetics of spaces and, you know, with your trees and the, you know, the, mil the Milky Way spirals and all that, and, you know, part of your outreach. Because I think uh, one thing that, uh, you know, of course, there's, there's one aspect of how to make some of these more abstruse, let's say, ideas. Uh, some things which maybe, let's say, ch children and such like can relate to in a much more direct way. But also, in a way, historically, astronomy has been one science that has had a certain kind of maybe connection with art. You know, if you look at some of the astronomers themselves, like Herschel, who's a musician, and, uh, you know, some of the uh, early planetary model, uh, you know, uh, things like that, which, which really works of art in their own way. And also, that could be something that has a place as well in terms of, you know, a museum or whatever, which could be one way of giving a maybe perspective to where astrology fits into all this in terms of the cultural thing, which has led to maybe, uh, you know, it's played a role in terms of maybe the art or architecture and so on. Uh, and, and, and that's there across cultures, whether it's, you know, Arab astrolabes and so on. Uh, and at the same time, you know, it helps to make the separation that that has its place in a cultural context, but it's not really part of the, you know, you know it doesn't have to be integrated to a modern scientific understanding or into, you know, the fact of it being, uh, you know, superstition and all these things could be clarified that way. So just thinking about whether that's also not some aspect to be thought about more in terms of, you know, the role of, you know, maybe you could also have a, a... I think that's a very fascinating aspect anyway of what you've been doing. If, I don't know if I managed to convey it. May I request Dr. Sanjeev Saxena to report? Thank you, sir, for the privilege. When a scientist in this country joins the profession, they have certain iconic personalities across di disciplines whom they idealize, rather than the cricketers and the film stars. And they desire to meet, see, listen, and talk to them at least once in their lifetime. Dr. Narlekar is certainly such a person whom many of us wish to meet not only once, but any given opportunity. The large gathering of scientists, young, and well, some not so young, present here, and the enthusiasm with which people have asked him the questions is a testimony of what I say. So we are indeed privileged to have you amongst us, and thank you to have agreed to share your experiences with us in such a candid and lucid manner. My colleagues who are attending this MDP program are senior officers from various science and technology departments. I am sure they have not only imbibed the words of wisdom, but also taken the tricks of trade and science management told by you and would implement them in the respective organization which they are representing. As a mark of gratitude, I once again request everyone to please give a big round of applause to Professor Nalika. Thank you, sir, for being with us. Professor Ramamurthy, the chairperson, is a family member to NIAS and also to the extended family of the participants of the program. We would like to thank you, sir, for meticulously planning the program and the opportunity provided to us for listening to Professor Nalikar and sharing the same space with him. Mr. Narsimhan and his team deserve our appreciation for making all the logistic arrangements and ensuring that they worked perfectly. Finally, I would like to thank one and all present here in the hall for their kind participation. Thank you very much.